All right, we're going to go ahead and start. Yeah. And like I said, for everybody, uh, don't take notes. Just we're going to review the course, go over some things. If you have questions, ask. Um, if you want to slow down and ask your own questions, that's fine. Everything that I've got, I've given you guys, it's shared in the folder. So you've got, I think now, four review PowerPoints. You've got uh, two review packets. You've got like three sample tests. Um, we've got that stuff. I figure Monday we'll do the review on the multiple choice, but if Marcella wants to do, I'll, look, you can do free response, whatever. It's what you need. Okay. So you want to do that, that's fine. Um, and it's just trying to get everything else. I told the gentleman, didn't tell you, uh, your final grade, you will be taking the final on that last day. You're getting an A on it automatically. I don't even care if you study, I don't care if you put A, B, C, D, whatever. But like I told somebody that if you do it legitimately, you know, and you're at a B, and you get a, per, you know, he says a five on it, I have no problem giving you an A in the class. Because if you know the stuff here, you know the stuff here. You know, I don't give a crap about the homework part. If you know your stuff, then you have it. That, that I've never understood why people said, well, you get a C because you didn't do the homework, but you got a five on the test. And I knew some students that had that, so. So. That's what I've got for you guys, so let's review this and go through um, and see where we're at. There's one thing that I don't like on this, and I'll say where it is. For the multiple choice questions, read the whole question. Uh, make sure you notice the accepts questions, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Make sure the not and the accept. Um, they almost turn this into like true-false questions. Um, if you're a more deliberate test taker, skip some of the questions, return back if you have time. Leave blank only if you can't eliminate options, but just guess. That's the best thing there for you. Now, this one I don't agree with, um, basically because it says do A, B, and C, don't do those. And I've talked to many, many readers that are reading them, and they say don't do A, B, just do paragraphs. Do they, do they want you to do like a, like a grammatically formatted free response, or can we kind of just like skip around? What do you mean, skip around? Because it says, do you need an intro? Like, do we need Right, you don't. Okay. In most of this case, there is, an, I mean, you're writing them from A-Push. You're writing them from the others. But in this, there's really not need, a need for an intro. But I don't want you to get into the point of bullet points or just, you know, yeah. little. Um, the <laughs> other um, review that I looked at was like three sentences for explain, two sentences for describe, one for list just for how long it should be, because your explain needs to have an example, in a real life example, or one that you make up. So read it carefully, uh, make sure that you answer the question. That's the biggest thing for me, is answer the question. You might read federalism, and then you do a data dump on federalism, and you didn't answer the question about federalism. Um, they normally require you to identify, define, list, explain, uh, discuss, analyze, so they'll try to do so, do those things, so brainstorm, find the best opportunities to earn points. Um, just don't do the first thing that comes to mind, but realize most of you will get the basic identifies, you'll get those things, so you're starting off pretty much at a three. And even some of the ones that I've seen, if you didn't know that Supreme Court case, remember that one that said polygamy? Well, you can kind of figure out the answer on that kind of stuff. Do you need an intro? Only if, they, if you basically take a definitive stand. Um, and I haven't seen any of them that say, what's your opinion, what's this? They're mostly, they're not like that. Um, so in the format part, um, I'm really saying don't do A, B, and C, just in depth. Uh, but go in order. You know, kind of makes sense, make it easier for the reader. Um, if you think of an additional thing or forgot to put it in, this says go to the right spot. See, they're telling you go to the right spot. I'm saying just put it anywhere. So if you think of something and you don't have A, B, and C, you can write it anywhere. You can write it at the end in the conclusion you get a point. If you do the A, B, C, you have to put your answer in A, B, C. Okay? Um, if the question asks for two examples, you can give them three or four. Okay? If, just to make sure you hit it. Make sure you have it. So that's kind of neat. There's going to be four essays. It's 100 minutes, the multiple choice is 60 questions in 45, 45 minutes. Okay? So here is the beginning part, it's 5 to 15%. This is a lot with, you'll have John Locke, you'll have maybe Rousseau, you might have the beginning, the colonies, but what, adopt, what we influenced our constitution, separation of powers, federalism, and our theories of democracy.
democracy. You will have these kind of graphs. What is the trend? What is the thing that's happening? So in the multiple choice and in normally your essays, you'll have something like this, or you'll have something like this, and then you'll be answering like three or four questions on it. So just, you guys have been pretty good with the graphs. And I like this one just because this relates, you know, political issues, get on the agenda. You start with people, interests, problems, concerns. You go into political parties, the elections, the media, the interest groups. Then you go into the agenda, which is the last section. And then you go into legislator, executive, and courts. Then you actually do it, and then it comes back to the people. So that puts the whole course in order, kind of like what we're all doing with this. So. A lot of us don't realize that the parties, the elections, the media does affect the policy. You know that. Linkage institutions, you know, that is parties, elections, that's the interest groups. And then our policy making, the legislative courts, the executive, the bureaucracy. So um, you'll hear the, those terms there. Remember back to chapter one? <coughs> chapter one, we have pluralist theory. Elite class theory, hyperpluralism. This one forgets. There's bureaucratic theory, and then you have the Marxist theory. Do you remember what the Marxist theory was? It's not business interests. It's business, sir. Capitalism makes the choices. Not that it's communism, but we make our choices based on who runs the, you know, the business, who owns the factors of production. What is the bureaucratic theory? It's not the bureaucracy runs the government because of their or makes policy, does all that, runs it. These are the bureaucrats. They're the unelected ones. And then you have pure, pure pluralist theory, competition among groups for policies. Groups will work together. They'll fight with each other. Then you have your basic power elite. Societies divide class lines. There's class lines. There's an upper class that will rule. Not all groups are equal. Some say our military is the highest. They're the ones there. Others will say it might be our business people. And then hyperpluralisms, groups are so strong, governments weaken, then there's too many groups fighting each other. Okay? John Locke, biggest one, because he did, who did he influence the most? Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, in which document? Declaration. Uh, Declaration. Um, so basically, he came with the natural <coughs> rights, consent of the government, limited government. So basically, he showed when we can revolt, when we can do that, when, um, and he also believed in like a legislative branch and separation of powers. The conservative revolution restored not the rights that the colonists felt they had lost because they were British citizens, um, felt that they had lost what, you know, England had because they were there. Um, so that's very interesting. A lot of people say we had, it was a progressive revolution. Okay. What is this revolt? So Articles of Confederation was the government that failed. Um, each state had its own sovereignty, its freedom, its independence. So they were 13 different countries. They had one uh, unicameral, one vote per state, no executive, no judiciary, and no the things that it couldn't do. Couldn't tax, couldn't regulate trade. But what could it do? Raise an army. Couldn't raise an army. We needed the states to raise it for him. They begged the states. It did a treaty. So it took ambassadors. You know, it, it did foreign affairs, sent ambassadors overseas. Shays' Rebellion was the big thing that caused the problem, the showing us that we needed this uh, change in government because they couldn't get, Massachusetts couldn't get a militia, the U.S. government couldn't get a militia, nobody could help and put down this little rebellion. Um, and they basically took over a courthouse because they didn't want to lose their land. They didn't want to lose their property because they couldn't pay their taxes and they couldn't pay, and they didn't even get paid from the revolution. So they had this big complaint. So states had different currencies. That was fascinating. Um, some states wanted to leave and go to Canada, like Vermont. Some states actually fought each other, like New York and Virginia. So you had different things like that. And they had laws that favored debtors. So that was uh, interesting. So we went to Philadelphia, and then we basically, Madison came up with the idea to get people to talk. He came up with the Virginia plan first. So that was there to discuss before everybody even got there, so that was there first. 
The New Jersey plan was done probably a month or two later, and that's why it kind of lost probably, and then the Connecticut compromise. And then we had some what other compromises? We had three-fifths. We had the uh, Electoral College was a compromise. We had the slave trade ended in 1808, and then we had no taxing exports. So we had a lot of different compromises and things, a lot of different issues. Um, a lot of issues were between the North and the South. A lot of the issues were between large states and small states. So, what was the purpose of the uh, Constitutional Convention? To was it to revise the articles? Just to revise. So it wasn't to come up with a new constitution. And how many how many states had to agree? It was unanimous. In the articles, you had to oh, get oh. everybody. In the articles, everybody had to agree. And so they even changed that. Okay. A lot of uh, anti-federalists said that there were no rights in the Constitution. There were. Um, some individual rights were there, like there was no writ of habeas corpus, no bills of detainer, no ex post facto laws. Everybody know what those are? No. What's habeas corpus? Habeas corpus, that you need to know your charges when you're being put in jail. You need to know what you're being held there for. What was your crime? Bill of attainer is where actually the legislature determines whether you're guilty or not, and they write this bill and say, yep, yeah, you're done. And then the ex post facto law is you're innocent at the time they made the law, and then all of a sudden, retroactively, you're guilty. Okay? Uh, no religious qualifications for holding office. Um, they have rules for treason. That's one reason why it's fascinating when I talk about the Second Amendment, because everybody says the Second Amendment is there to overthrow the government. Really? It's not. It's there to put it down. Okay? And then right to trial by jury in criminal cases. Those were all in the original Constitution. So they did have rights. And then the others were not specified, so there was no Bill of Rights in the original Constitution. So that was then added. Okay? So then here is Madison's model with the three branches of government. So you had separation of powers, checks and balances, federal system. So if anybody says, what are the principles of our Constitution? Those are like three of them. So separation of powers, checks and balances, federal system. Can you guys come up with, well, actually, there's four. What are some other, there's six principles in the Constitution. What would be others? So there's limited government, there's separation of powers, checks and balance, federalism, so there's two more. One is with the judicial branch, one's judicial review, so that's a principle that they have that other constitutions don't have, and the other is popular sovereignty, that the whole purpose of this is from the people. Okay. So everybody understand that we've got a Congress, we've got the House and the Senate, then Congress is the... Um, they basically make the laws. Goes to the executive branch, we'll go through it. It's got the executive and departments, the independent government agencies, they've got the White House staff, and then they make the they enforce the laws and they um, basically make sure the laws are done. And then they've got the judicial branch, court of appeals, Supreme Court, district courts, and so on. And then these list the these right here would give you your checks and balances. And I think you can come up with them. You can come up with definitely the Supreme Court will decide whether something is unconstitutional or not. Um, a lot of interesting ones for Congress. Congress can actually put the number of people on the Supreme Court. So they can make it 5 or 25, or they can even say, what's your jurisdiction? They can actually delete lower courts or add lower courts and add more. So Congress has got a lot of power on the judicial branch that we don't think of. Normally we just think, eh, all they can do is you know, do a constitutional amendment. President doesn't have that much, right? Or does President have a lot of power? He appoints. What? He appoints justices. Yeah, that's right. Congress can ignore them. That's correct. And then we'll see. Will Merrick Garland get confirmed? Yeah, good joke about that. The correspondence thing. Yep. All right. Federalist Papers, kind of important, um, 85 of them. The big ones are 10 and 51. There's also 78, which is at Alexander Hamilton's about the uh, judiciary. But these are the ones that are most likely on any test. Factions are bad, but in a democracy we have them. So 10 is about factions and political parties. 
and that the republic that Madison created was the best way to stop factions. Okay? Do you agree with it? Yeah. Why? Because on the second bullet point it says that uh, we'll check the balance is you can make one you can't make one faction too powerful. Sure. Now it's great for our country, but you can see the problem in a state, right? Yeah. Because in a state you've got states like you know North Carolina that's all Republican and they're Republican governor, Republican legislature, Republican courts. They're passing HB you know two that says there's no transgender people. You know they can't go to bathrooms. They pass a law saying that Baptist is the state religion. So locally, low level, factions are very important. But when you get national level, Republican Party, Democratic Party, Green Party, all the different interest groups, um, our republic stops the, stops the power of those. Then checks and balances, or 51, that's the most famous quote, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Madison said that. First, you must enable the government to control the governed and then control itself. Um, and this was basically the argument to have checks and balances. So this was 51. Okay? So Hamilton wrote most of them. John Jay, the fewest. Madison, mo the most famous ones, 10 and 51. Um, Ma Madison's name, Pluribus. Pluribus. Uh, first 10 amendments to the Constitution, drafted in response to the Anti-Federalists, and Madison wrote most of them. He wrote most of the Constitution, did it. And then we have John Marshall, our Supreme Court Justice, in the beginning. Those are the two out of the three big beginning cases. What's the other case that's big? Which one? Marbury versus Marbury versus Madison. Madison. Yeah. Kind of big, that did ju judicial review. Yeah, yeah. So McCullough versus Maryland did the supremacy clause, implied powers, you know, elastic clause. Um, you can't tax... States can't tax the federal government type thing. So this one was huge. And then Gibbons versus Ogden was Commerce Clause. And basically expanding to navigation and beyond and really kind of important for establishing the Commerce Clause. So don't forget Marbury, Judicial Branch. Um, how do you change the Constitution? Um, most, and even like with my regular class, they realize there are four ways to amend the Constitution Propose and ratify are not two different ways. That's one way. So to propose a constitutional amendment, it's two-thirds of Congress. But then you need three-fourths to ratify. So this is one way. <coughs> this is second way. This is the third way. This is the fourth way. But they need the both. They need the propose and the ratify. So there was one essay that we did on that. We did, how do you propose an amendment? And most people said one way was to be proposed and the second way was to ratify. No, that is, you got to put them together, okay? So make sure you have that. This is the most common way, and that's normally what we really have. Now, there are some people that definitely want this to happen, and then they want this to go on there. They want us to have a constitutional convention again. A lot of people, both Republicans and Democrats, want to do that. So, these are the ways to propose amendments and change. How many have been done? 27. 27. Absolutely. Okay. Informal change. So, we see the informal changes, and this is easier because it, you know, it's hard to get two-thirds of the uh, Congress and three-fourths of the states but you have judicial review, so power of courts to strike down laws. Just political practice, like George Washington saying two terms, and that's what we're going to do. Parties were introduced, electoral college become rubber stamp. You've got technology, you've got the bureaucracy, you've got all these different ways to informally change. So, lots of ways. A law can change the Constitution, and a lot of people don't get that. But we kind of like change, and we change over time. Right. What fractions do you need to know? Two-thirds, three-fourths. But if you don't get it, that's fine. What do you have to say? Simple majority or a super majority. You don't have to get the fractions totally correct, but you have to know 
with an amendment what you need. Okay? To pass a bill, it's simple majority. Is this true today? Mm, no. Yeah. Well, um, it's true, but it's not true. Because you can still have the presidential veto, right? No. no. It's true. This is all you need to pass a bill. But in the Senate, what do you have to do? What do the Republicans do every time when a Democrat proposes a law and well, vice versa? What do they do? Filibuster. They filibuster. Uh, How do you need to do a filibuster? How many votes do you need? Three Nope. Well, What's the number? It's close. 60. 60. 60. So we've changed this in the Senate to 60. Especially only if they're... In, well, I, I just think in the Senate that's where we're going to. Um, and it just is has because I'm going like even if there was Republicans were House Senate and the President and the courts, the Democrat few of them would have would be able to filibuster do that and then you'd need the 60 votes to end it. Um, immigration passed. We have compre uh, comprehensive immigration reform passed, but it didn't pass 60. So it got the 55. It got the simple majority. It got the House and the Senate to pass this. But it didn't get the 60 in the Senate. So, um, ratify a treaty, confirm judges. Um, but look at this. To confirm a judge, appeals court or anything, Supreme Court, just a majority vote. So, it doesn't need to be two-thirds. It just needs the Senate to do it. But, it do, but what we're finding is there are now filibustering Supreme Court justices, so they're now not even voting on them, so it takes a lot. So look at what needs a majority and what needs two-thirds, what needs a supermajority. You just realize those. But you don't need to get the percentages of fractions right. Okay? Federalism is big. Federalism is huge. We have national, state, and local. So here are the national powers. Here are the concurrent powers, and these are the reserved powers, the ones just going to the states. So obviously the states are to establish local governments, regulate intrastate. If there's anything intra anymore, can you come up with any intrastate? Intrastate. Shipping. Anything. No, I disagree. I think everything is interstate. Tell me about it. Casanova Brothers Pizza, my favorite pizza place in Gilbert, is run by these two brothers in Gilbert, Arizona. They hire everybody in Gilbert, and they make pizza. One shop. Is that intrastate or interstate? It's interstate. Interstate. Sorry, it's intrastate. Yeah, it's, it's what? Intra. It's within the state. Do you think so? As long as they're not ordering stuff outside the state. Bingo! Oh. How do you know that? Well, what if they order their stuff at Fry's? Automatically, that is now, they're ordering stuff from it. What if they use ADP for their payroll? It's a national company, that's not, I mean, <coughs> there's so many things in there, but in general, in the old ways, it was inter intrastate. But now the courts have said, well, if they order things from out of state, if they get supplies from any, they order something at Amazon, right? Where'd they get their oven? Probably wasn't made in Arizona. I mean, it could have been, but I, I you know, who knows? Uh -huh. So we have that. They conducted elections. So the states conduct elections, even national elections, the presidential elections run by the state. They ratify amendments. They take care of the health. So those are the state reserved powers. Uh, and we do have quite a few, both the concurrent powers. And then look what's denied. So I like this chart. What states can't do. And titles of nobility. Well, nobody can. Isn't that good? Because that's that old English. And I don't even think we care anymore. But that was way back when we really cared, didn't want to be like England. Um, so both of them can't do that. Both of them can't do slavery. Both, can, both can't deny citizens' the right to write, vote because of race or color. Um, and then here is the federal government. Okay. Makes sense. I like that chart. Yeah. Here is the state's obligations to each other. Full faith and credit, extradition, privileges and immunities. 
Sometimes it's hard to figure out what these are. Each state must honor the laws and legal proceedings of other states, marriages and debts. Too bad we don't take that with gay marriage, but if that Supreme Court case did that for different reasons. Extradition returns suspects to the crimes where they're committed. And then each state must grant citizens of other states the same rights and privileges they grant to their own. Cannot unreasonably discriminate against citizens of other states. So I'm from California, I can buy property in Arizona. I can't say, nope, you're from California, you can't buy property here. I have to do that. And I can't even say you have a higher price. Yes? If, uh, if, if full faith and credit doesn't really exist anymore, how does, how does it? It does exist. exist. Oh. Okay. It exists. It's there. We honor the laws and legal things. My feeling was just that oh. the pro problem with gay marriage oh. was why didn't they use that to sue? Why didn't they use that? Because that made perfect sense to me. If you were married in Vermont, why shouldn't you be married in Arizona? They didn't really use that clause. They didn't do it. They sued over other reasons. And eventually the Supreme Court said, we have to honor this. But it took time. So, but in debts and marriages, like, you know, we honor the laws from other states. We do that. Uh, can I charge out-of-state tuition for college students? Yes. Yeah. So that doesn't affect either one? No, it doesn't. Courts have said we can do that. I can charge out-of-state tuition for out-of-state people because they're not residents of my state, but I can't do, you know, I can't deny them to own property or our court system if they have a problem here. They get to our courts. All right. Um, this one we covered pretty well, except for the names. You'll see cooperative federalism. That's the marble cake. Make sure you know that. This is since New Deal. So this is all the way up until Roosevelt, and this is after Roosevelt, and then this has been since, like, Reagan. So when you're looking at it. So cooperative federalism is shared. Uh, basically, the assignments, the working together are shared between states and national government. Um, shared costs, shared administration, um, federal guidelines, you do this, and then the states will then follow. Dual federalism is they were all separate. You had one sphere for the states, one for the national government. They didn't intertwine. Um, and then de devolution is basically giving more power back to the states. And we've been doing that forever and ever and ever. Biggest one was this, welfare reform bill. Um, did that big time. And then we had more and more just trying to give states more power. Federal government, less power. Okay? Isn't that huge? Okay? Because of the money, this is why the federal government can say, North Carolina, you broke this law, you, did, you broke the Civil Rights Act, we can take money back from you. States' budgets are huge with federal money. Federal supports states in many ways, and they can't just go, go without it. Where's the money? These are the, the different types of money. You will probably be asked about block grants, categorical grants, and then the differences between these two. So make sure you cover those. If, like you said, you're weak on something, I think we're normally weak on this stuff. Just in general, I might not be as good as going over it. Mm -hmm. Didn't cover it a lot. So this is kind of like, hit this. Um, unfunded mandate, it's real simple. There's no money to it, but you must do it. You know, that, that kind of stinks. But that's like the Supreme Court said, separate but equal, no longer. you got to you got to integrate, and we're not giving you any money to do it. you just got to do it. Yeah, the free response, we have to give examples on specific mandates that are... You'd have to explain, but the, the, med, the ones that I have seen are yes. Like, they have had examples of these things. So, yeah, you'd have to give examples. You'd have to give... In, I don't necessarily say laws. Uh -huh. Like, you wouldn't have to know the Americans with Disabilities Act, per se. Uh -huh. But you could describe it. You could say, in the 1980s, we have, you know, every... Building has to be wheelchair accessible, right? Yeah. You give your example. You didn't give any money. That was unfunded. Okay, so give examples. Um, so, I really um, the actual, you know, the actual act. I would, I'd say you'd be fine. You don't have to know. Um, and know what the project grants are, the block grants, what they're used for. Um, which has got more strings. 
No, those are categorical. categorical. These are the strings, these are less strings, and that's why states like them. States want the block grants because they want to do that. One of the proposals was uh, Paul Ryan wants to do Social Security, no, excuse me, Medicare as a block grant. He wants to get rid of the federal government doing Medicare and just say, okay, here's money for the states, you do Medicare. Can we do really it. do that though? No. I thought, I thought uh, welfare used to be that the... Medicaid. Me oh, Medicaid. Medicare. He actually wants to do Medicare like Obamacare. And that's one reason why it confuses me why they don't like Obamacare and they want to do the same thing with Medicare. So it doesn't make sense. All right, here we go, 10 to 20. So I see a little bit on this, so you'll see some tests that have more or not. This is your report. Um, so how do you get your beliefs? How do you get this? This is political socialization. And here we go. So reapportionment, make sure you know that with the census every 10 years, we have reapportioned. And isn't that interesting how they make those shifting populations? Where are people going? Oh. California? Where? The coast. The coast? Where do you think we're going to? We're leaving the Northeast, right? Yeah. We're leaving the Northeast. We're probably leaving a lot in Ohio, Minnesota, Michigan, coming south to the Sun Belt. I still think people are coming here, Arizona, Vegas, and those kind of things. But every 10 years, 2020 will be big. We'll have another reapportionment and see who gains seats and who loses. We're going to gain Sure. Who's the biggest? I think your family. Um, school, education, mass media. Um, I put religion in there. A lot of people will put religion in there for where you get your beliefs and your thoughts, and this is how you get your orientation. Is it passed down by generation? Yeah. You think so? I think so. Absolutely. Okay. Aging increases uh, political participation, strength of party attachment. And what was interesting is millennials passed the baby boomers. So we have more millennials than we have baby boomers, which is fascinating. Baby boomers are not really politically participate, and they also, millennials don't have an attachment to a party. So, fascinating to see what will happen as they get older. Okay. What are you? Oh, boy. <laughs> what are you? Come on. That's a, that's a tough, tough question right there. I got a lot of adjectives that I could include. Okay. So, are you liberal, conservative? Are you... A uh, moderate, what are you? You gotta say uh, slightly left moderate. Sides? Slightly left moderate authoritarian. Okay, authoritarian. Marcel? Just liberal. Liberal? Like liberal leaning moderate. Liberal, so you're leaning closer to him? Closer to him than I am. Okay, and you are, are conservative? Yeah, moderate. Moderate conservative, so you're moderate right? No, well, this is a fascist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even have that choice. Ideologues think in ideological terms, 12% of the population, group benefits, rely on party labels, so we got a lot, 42%, nature of the times, current times are good or bad, 24%, no issue content based on personalities, 22%, that might be your Donald Trump's, 22%. Uh, I think this is an old slide, obviously, because I don't think, I think most of you said we're now going more liberal. Right? Yeah, recording, I say. What? The things recording. Yeah. Well, I hope so. <laughs> are you recording? I was thinking about that. Yep. We are recording. Yeah. So, um, I think that most of us are seeing, in your report, said we're, there's more liberals than conservatives. Um, biggest look at the moderates is 40, and it's been consistently, and you guys would probably put yourself in that moderate category, even though you might be more conservative and you might be more liberal. Um, political party? Political party? Democrat. Would you would you actually sign up? Yeah, I would sign up. Well, because I think it's like important to like have a political party. Yeah. Okay. Democrat so as well. What? Democrat. Okay. Probably have to register as a Democrat. Okay. You would register all of you would register for a party then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. If I could. If I turn until, until we change the, the the whole like um, close primary thing then. Okay. <laughs> Percent engaging in activity, tried to influence votes of others, that's the green. Look at the income level, very low, attended political meetings and rallies. 
and then get into a political party. So you're looking at <coughs> income level and how it does. Class income inequality and participation. Low income people, do they participate a lot? No. It's hard to get them to vote. Hard to get them to vote at all. Okay. How elections work, so we're kind of going into elections. You might see some things on referendum, recall, uh, initiative. We have them in Arizona. You'll be voting on these. So initiative, voters in some states propose a legislation. In a referendum, the legislator comes up with the bill or something, and then people vote on that. So one is voters decide what it is, and the other is the legislature does. Um, this initiative requires specific numbers of signatures to be on the ballot. You'll see people at polling stations have, could you sign this, Sue grocery store, sign this. Um, if you do an online thing, that doesn't count. So if you do anything from online that says sign, not, sign this petition, it's really not that. It gives us an idea. It gives us an idea what to do. Maybe we can get your name to go to get you to sign it. Put us there. Do you like these? Yeah. So are propositions, initiatives, or referendums? Uh, they can be either one. Most of them are initiatives that I see, but there's ones that the legislature just wants to cop out from doing their job and say, let the voters decide. Um, I've seen more and more states say, I don't want to raise taxes. Let the voters do that. So let the voters. So we'll put a bill in, let's raise the sales tax, 2%. Let the voters decide. That's probably a referendum. Because when would the people say, let's go ahead and raise the taxes? Yeah, well, if, they, if they do, though, then they can't complain. That's right. If they want to, then that sounds like a good okay. idea. Sure. Whether to vote. Deciding whether to vote. So we have, what, low turner turnout? We're the lowest in the world. Mm -hmm. um, we say it's a rational choice not to vote. I know some people want to make it required. Um, I'm more into the automatic registration. I like that idea where you're automatically registered doing something like that so you don't have to do that. Political efficacy, you guys know what that means, but it's a belief that one's participation really matters. You're voting because you believe it matters. Those that don't vote say, I have no, my participation doesn't matter. <coughs> uh, civic duty, you should always vote, but others would say the opposite. So who votes? Look at that. More education, older, us white people, gender, ooh, look at that. You're more likely to vote than you guys, really. Married, union membership, they add up. And like in the one test we had, it was who was most likely not to vote? 18-year-olds yeah. without high school education? Are you kidding me? Probably won't. Political parties, had them since the beginning, can't get rid of them, even though you guys hate them. And I think, Diego, didn't you say, we shouldn't we get rid of them sometime? I say, I mean, political parties are fine, just they shouldn't have as much influence as they do okay. on, okay. like, elections. Okay. Interest groups are huge, um, but they're also more single-issue groups. They're more things about something that you like. They're more activities. You actually join them. Uh, interest groups, PACs. Think PACs with interest groups. Think PACs for them. And then they're different than super PACs. Super PACs are totally different than these, so realize that. And then we have mass media and how they affect politics. What do you think the, their effect on elections are, mass media? Probably scorekeeper. Absolutely scorekeeper, and they encourage that. I think they really want it to be close between Hurley and Hillary and Bernie, right? They want it to be close between Trump and Hillary because they want that to sell things, right? They don't want a huge, landslide. you know, a landslide. Okay. It's amazing that Trump got through and got through the primaries without spending hardly any money, which yeah. is amazing. There was got an article online that said that he received the equivalent of $2 billion in free advertising. Absolutely. There's one, there's one group, I think it's CBS Morning Show, they do not allow Donald Trump to call in. <laughs> You'd get a lot of it, because all the others want him to call in, and that's not fair. But they said, we're not going to do it. We're not going to let him call in and just do it, and he just doesn't. Now, they think they're doing good by that, but, you know, he brings people's ratings up. 
Um, Sixty percent of convention, presidential campaign spending is TV ads. Is that well spent? Yeah, probably. Well, nowadays it might not be. But um, but like if we look at the voter turnout, definitely like people who watch TV now are probably the people who like go out and vote the most. Like the more the yeah. married, the married, the married people, the older people, the male. I think. Well, those two ads that Hillary came out were pretty pretty impressive, and they're all in, online. They're not showing anywhere on TV. Now, maybe they will, but even like, you know, Daisy ad, they were showing once. That was the most famous ad, you know, with Johnson. There's been a couple that are really famous. They're not showing a lot, but there's lots in ads. I just don't know if it's worthwhile anymore. Obama ran a good social media campaign. I think Trump was very active on social media. I think he'll be able to. I don't think he's going to spend that much money. He said, though, he's going to spend a billion dollars. We'll see. Um, the policy agenda, the issues that attract serious attention to public officials and others, that's the role of the media. They try to guide and tell us what's important. People invest their political capital in an issue, goodwill, so policy entrepreneurs. So mass media affects all of this. Meaning a party, linkage institution, they pick the parties, they run the campaigns, they give cues to voters, they give policies. In the convention, they come up with a platform. So you'll know by being a Republican what the platform is, or being a Democrat what the platform is. Party identification is your self-proclaimed preference from one party to the other. Are you guys going to do the bottom one, ticket spl splitting? I don't think so. Well, I don't know. You probably won't. Will you? I might. You might? What do you think for you? I definitely could. I could see myself doing that. Any of you vote for John McCain? Over... It's Ann Kirkpatrick? Possibly. See, there's your ticket split. You possibly might vote, but who knows? I don't know who you're going to vote for president. But that might be one where a lot of Democrats might vote for John McCain. You go to like Massachusetts, there's lots of like, agreeable Republican yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned once, I don't know if it's true, do you think this is a critical election? I... I would say so, a, definitely. I don't know if it's Thank a critical you. election, but it definitely, like, uh, it's unprecedented, like, having two different, like, from by, by the, both parties, having, like, uh, outside candidates, like, get this far as they did. Well, I mean, Kay. like, if you had to pick one, this is probably the best example of an election where you have people from their party that don't want to vote for their party. Yeah. But, like, and also people who wouldn't normally vote who are voting for their party. But if it's, like, uh, in terms of, like, sure, like, these people, like, they wanted to vote for somebody else, but they didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this time, you know. This time there's a choice. Trump. Do yeah. you see a new coalition? Trump and Clinton. Yes. I definitely see one, yeah. And what do you, what's the new coalition? The Trump, the... Trump. Yeah, the, the, so I think socially liberal, economically conservative. Yeah, you got, and libertarians just in general are yeah. blocking to, especially as he's uh, contemplating putting a Ron or Rand Paul, I don't know which I heard. He said wrong, actually. Okay. So you're thinking he's trying to get Democrats mostly, yeah, he, he and trying to get working white Democrats. Yeah. Okay, we try to go. Democrats, stuff okay. Like I mean, they were Reagan Democrats for a reason. I mean, they were Democrats and they voted for Ronald Reagan, and then you know, it's the, those white voters have been there for since, but they might still be. Uh, party realignment. When was the last time we had that? 1990s. Republicans flipped, absolutely. Um, and there were, I mean, there were Democrats probably into the early 2000s that were in the South. Most of them switched in George Bush's time back to, to Republican where they should be. A lot of it was in the 90s. Um, so, yeah, party realignment, it's fascinating. Um, third parties, any have any impact this election? You're saying probably not? Not this time. Okay. You don't think Trump? Thing. You don't think uh, conservative will run as a third party? You don't think Bernie will run as a third party? Oh, I think that's a concern, but I don't think that like they've been in the spotlight. Because you know, normally you hear something. In 2012, I heard a lot from the Libertarian Party, yep. and then we made fun of the Constitutionalist Party, mm -hmm. and, and yep. then we would have mentioned the Green Party. But this time, I've heard nothing. The I mean, only time I've heard the phrase Green Party is whenever we talk about Jill Stein. the Green Party. Yeah. yeah. Well, Max in second period. Hi, Max. He says he's <laughs> going to vote for Jill Stein. Can't vote for Hillary, so he's going to do. He's going to vote. Says he's going to do that. We'll see if he does. But you know, you have uh, Jill Stein, and then of course, what is Gary Johnson? He's the Libertarian. Oh, yeah. 
He's going like, I'm here, I'm here, vote for me. If you don't like Donald Trump, we're here, our libertarians. But guess what? They rarely win. Can you figure out the last time the third party won a state? Wasn't it 1912? Not 1912. Oh, was that guy in Nick Bush? Nope. It was that. Oh, 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 it was oh, a social George, Wall George Wallace. George Wallace, the Dixie Party, won, won five states. George the Wallace. Dixie Party, the Dixiecrats. So yeah. he won that, but that was it. And then after John Anderson, Ross Perot, um, Ralph Nader never won a state. So all the big ones there never won. Um, and then before that, it was the Bull Moose. And then you were like 1912, because Roosevelt was popular. So he won, but he really destroyed it. Was that a socialist or a communist? Or the Eugene Dev? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, that was, uh, that was 1910s, 20s. Did he win? Did he win? I don't think he won a state. He got over a million votes. Yeah, it. absolutely. Ross Perot got quite a few. Your primaries, and this is the ones you all hate closed primaries, right? Not for like being able to not vote for uh, like having to vote for one party, but, like your party, but like because it's uh, like the whole voter registration issues that we saw. Right, but I like closed primaries. You guys like open primaries, but know the difference. Then blank pr blanket pro primaries don't even have labels, kind of like you can vote for whoever you want to go back and forth. Um, and then you have the national convention and national committee. National Committee basically keeps the party going between conventions. Um, you have the chairperson that goes, and you'll see Ryan Sprevis go on the Sunday shows, and he'll talk, and he'll you know, do that, but that's him. And then the convention's going to be fun. We're going to have two conventions. Um, they'll probably be, maybe the Democrat will be more exciting than the Republican this year. We'll see. Um, and then those are the different types of primaries. Do you like primaries better than the conventions or caucuses? You know, I, I, I honestly, caucuses are interesting. That's all I can say. There. Yeah. So, caucuses, well, one of the problems with the delegates is the pro early ones get too much power, right? Yeah. California, the largest state, has no say in this year's election. It goes to New Hampshire, it goes to Iowa, it goes to South Carolina, and that's crazy. So it says disproportionate attention to the early states. Prominent politicians find it difficult to make time to run which is true. Money is too big of a role. And I don't know if that is the case now. Is it the case now with Citizens United? Everybody's got money. Bernie didn't have a problem with money. Yeah, I think the lowest, I was looking at uh, all of the candidates who ran and had like, their financial information, and the lowest amount of money that was put in by any candidate, Jim Gilmore, I believe, <laughs> still put in uh, half a million dollars I know. into his very limited campaign. Who who of the major candidates dropped for money? No. Right? Marco didn't drop for money. Jeb Bush didn't drop for money. They all they dropped because they were losing and they had a lot of money. Now in past elections, your money ran out. If you weren't winning, your money ran out, you'd have to drop because your campaign wasn't going. It might be Lincoln Chafee, Jim Gilmore, those guys that really didn't do anything. But most of the major candidates, especially in the Republican Party, they had no problem. Uh, participation in caucuses is low. And then for, you know, that's one thing Bernie says, if we had high, high turnout, it helps him. He won a lot of caucus states and where it was low and less people participate. Okay. Here are some of the laws, like the one in the Federal Election Campaign Act of 74. The FEC runs the elections and basically sees whether PACs are fought, do it following the rules and stuff like that. If there's any problems with campaigns and how much money people give, what you spend on your campaign, there's rules and regulations. Look how many PACs are. 3,868. Lot to congressional candidates. Lots to candidates who support their issue regardless of policy. Um, the last bullet point, I would probably agree. I know Bernie complains about it all the time, but they haven't swayed an election as far as I can see. Now maybe locally they might be beginning to, don't know. Have they done anything on a presidential election? No. Okay. So look at all the requirements that they under the FEC Act. Campaign fund, public financing, full disclosure, limited contributions. 
Campaigns that have three effects on you, reinforcement, activism, activation, conversion. Mostly reinforce and activate. Very few times will campaigns convert you to a Republican or Democrat or change you. I love selective perception, right? You agree? Yeah. And now it's gotten so bad that, hey, if I don't want to listen to a liberal, I don't have to. If I don't want to hear a conservative idea, I don't have to, right? You can pick your radio, you can pick your TV, you can pick your internet. You can pick all of that stuff where you can only just agree with the same people. Incumbents, incumbents have a huge advantage. Does everybody understand the Electoral College? Mm -hmm. Anyone not? Yeah. Alexa? I think I got it. You think you got it? Yeah. If I want to change the Electoral College and change it immediately, can we do it? No. Yes. Congress, so like you have to repeal an amendment. No. Look at that top one. Each state has as many votes as senators and representatives. Look at the next one. Winner take all. I don't need an amendment to change it. All I need is my representatives, my Senate in my state, and the governor to sign it. We can go to congressional districts. I am very surprised that Republicans haven't done it. Congress is run by what? Republicans. There are more congressional districts run by Republicans. If you ran it that way, guess what? Mitt Romney would have won 2012. Mitt Romney would have won that. Totally, for sure. Why don't they do that? Doesn't make sense to me. And they can do that without a constitutional amendment. They can change it to any way that they want to give the electors that they can. Okay? Electors meet in December. Votes are reported by the vice president in January. That's one of his kind of like duties. No candidate gets 270. House of Representatives votes for president. One state, each state gets one vote. And that is how the founding fathers thought every election would be. They thought it would never get to 270 and that the electoral college would never work and the house would choose every time. Boy, were they wrong, right? It only happened like twice. Interest groups. This is probably, if you, Mar uh, Marcelo, I would say we're a little weak on, right? Um, I would guess so. Yeah. I think this is one of, besides certain parts of federalism with the grants, this is kind of like where we might be weaker than we are in political parties or whatever else. So look at the interest group part. Um, and they're really not, they're pretty much similar to political parties, right? What's the only difference? They're not elected. Yeah, they're not involved with the running that person and running a, getting that person in there. And the interest groups really aren't there because political parties run the government after they look at, there's a lot going with political parties, getting elected, getting in the government. Interest groups are not the same. Okay. Interest groups choose sides. They're policy specialists. They're actually ones that try to pursue goals in many areas. And then iron triangles, are we good with those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good with that? Good. What's the one that competes with Iron Triangles? The uh, issue network. The issue network. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Here's most of the test. This is where I said so. In Congress, presidency, bureaucracy, and courts, 35 to 45%. Figure also mostly on the essays, too. We could have something with them. So here we go. All right. How do you like that? Democrat, 202. Republican, 232. Who's the one? In the Senate, that's Bernie. What about King? What? There's another Angus? King. Yeah. Then men, women, and then the race. More Asians than you thought, right? <laughs> Where's my Native Americans? Uh, religion, look at Protestant. Look at Roman Catholic, and you can't tell me we're not a Judeo-Christian nation. Right? That's why we can get it there. Look at our lawyers. Then we have our business people, education. So sad. So low. Real estate's got a few, so that's who's in our Congress. Who wins? Look at that. 
incumbents win. Incumbents have a huge advantage. And actually, it's weirder, but incumbents have a bigger advantage in House than they do in the Senate. Why do you think that's the case? I think because they don't feel like the House is really... Yeah, they don't take it, the electors don't take it as seriously. Okay, what else? And they have more to vote for. Or to, to know, not, not vote for necessarily, but to know. I don't think they're as well known as the senators. Okay. It's just, there's just two senators for you to know. Mm -hmm. So why would they get voted out less? Everybody knows John McCain. Wouldn't you think his re-election would be more than maybe some, you know, Matt Salmon? I guess they value the, the Senate more than they value the House just in general. Because there's only two, because it's statewide. There's more money that's put into the Senate. It's only that, so there's more competition for it. So in general, the House, if you heard the person, you just vote that person back in. And you, if it's the incumbent, it's so huge. And there's very, it's 600,000, right? There's only very few people in there. Advertising is a big advantage. Money is a big advantage. Things that they've already done is a big advantage. I love credit claiming. Even if they didn't vote for it, they can take credit for it. And then casework, don't forget that. Help constituents get what they want and you help them. Love pork barrel. <coughs> Projects and things made available in a district paid for by Obama stimulus package, paid for by this, stuff like that. Most, you know, opponents are weak. They're inexperienced. They're unorganized. They're underfunded. So most incumbents have got a lot of advantages. Here's how Congress is organized. It's bicameral. So we got the House and the Senate. You should know those. Know the different rules. There were some essays, like you said, on um, there were essays on the difference between the House and Senate and lawmaking, and doing that, knowing the differences between the Rules Committee and then the filibuster. House has got definitely a lot more rules. Anyone take a guess on how many representatives we'd have if we followed the Constitution from the very beginning? Like two thousand, probably. What do you think? It was one per 30,000 people. So go ahead, Mike, how much would it be? It would be about over 11,000 representatives. So they stopped at 1929 and 435. So it's stuck there until Congress chooses, but that's where we're at now. I think we probably should increase it, don't you? Yeah, 10,333. Yeah. And what did you use for the population of the U.S.? Just uh, 310 million. So he went, well, I think it's 335, 350, so, yeah, big difference. Leadership. Um, leadership is important, and whoever runs it is by political party. The House has got the Speaker of the House that is elected by House members. A lot of you think they're only elected by Republicans or Democrats. They're elected by everybody. So they vote on that. They preside over the House. They decide who gets assignments who, when legislation comes up. And they're assisted by Majority Leader and Whips. And then the Senate. I bet. Who's sitting in the battle show? Led by the Vice President. What, when can the Vice President vote? When there is a time. Okay. And then you have the President Pro Tem. Who in the heck is that? That's, for, that's the individual who's there when the Vice President is there. Correct. So he has no power either. So they're just in... Um, just when the vice president is not there. The majority leader is the actual leader, not the president pro tem. And then they've got whips. Remember who that is in House of Cards? Um, Frank Underwood. Absolutely. Everybody knows Frank Underwood now. He's the whip there. Must work with the uh, leaders. They need to count the votes. And some are better than others. Uh, but just making sure you don't want to bring up a bill that you're not going to get the votes. It's kind of embarrassing. Okay. Here are our committees. Big one that you'll see on the test, of course, is the Joint Committee, which is the Conference Committee. So it's kind of like it is a Joint Committee and it is a Conference Committee, but that's one that we've used to resolve differences in bills. Uh, what's a select committee that you know of, that you've heard of, that's political in nature, that's against Hillary Clinton? Oh, the Benghazi. Yes, the Select Committee on Benghazi, the ninth one. There is one on that. So it's just a temporary purpose, just there. Standing committees are there all the time. So those are ones we've uh, looked at. There's one on banking, agriculture, all of those kinds. 
Guys need to take a bathroom break? Yeah. You good? Anyway. You good? Okay. Does anyone want to do an essay or do anything different, or do you want to cover the class for now? I want to just cover the class for now. Okay. Yeah. You okay? Yeah. So, how a bill becomes a law in our game. So, did you get most of it? The introduction is by a member in the house. Normally, it's put in the hopper. Then it's given a number. It's H, for, and then it's H1 to H10,000 or whatever it might be. S is S1 or S10,000. But in the Senate, an actual member like John McCain would actually have to introduce it. So it's introduced. It's logged in there. So it's going to be read probably three or four times. Um, then it's gone to a certain committee. So it goes to a committee who then refers it to a subcommittee. So subcommittees do most of the work. They do the hearings, they do the research, they do a lot of revisions on the bill, but subcommittees do most of the, sh the stuff. Most of your bills die in committee. Anyone know what that's called? Dying in committee? What's pigeonholed. The, the, oh, yeah. It's pigeonholed. It dies oh. in committee and it's just there. Yeah. Um, so you've got a subcommittee that is run, all of the committees are run based on the political party that's in charge, so their numbers that they have are based on the political party in charge and most of the committees. So if you are now in Republican hands, they run all the chairmen or chairwomen are Republican. So Democrats are in the minority on all the committees. So obviously if there's a Democratic bill, it's not going to be voted on, talked about, anything like that. So it would only be Republican bills and so on like that. Full committee, subcommittees got to vote it out. Then it goes to committee, committee's got to vote it out, and then it goes to then the Rules Committee in the House. There is no Rules Committee in the Senate. Leadership decides how the bill is taken. Um, there's floor action, so the full House decides, and they, they basically will make their speeches, normally 15-minute speeches. They debate them, they might add amendments, they might add writers. Um, and then the Senate has that stupid thing, what's it called, that can stop the bill? Filibuster. Filibuster. And then how do you end a filibuster? 60 votes. Or it's called cloture. Right. Correct. Okay. The bills have to be identical. Identical words, identical writing. So they go to a conference committee. Now, recently, in Obama's term, they basically looked at whichever one was gone through, I think they passed the same one. So they basically tried to, you know, they would try to pass the same version. So if the House got through, and the House was the more difficult one, they sent the Senate the identical bill. And they didn't say, let's not work it out. They basically sent them the same bill and hope they passed it. So we haven't had a conference committee for a long time. And most of the time, they're not working together. That requires both parties to work together to iron out differences in a bill. So what we're finding is recently, they're not doing the conference committee, they're doing the you're going to pass the identical bill that I passed. I passed it first, you're going to have to pass mine. You can't make any changes, so if the Senate makes any changes, then the bill's, the bill's dead. It has to be identical. Um, but on most tests, conference committee, that's the one that irons it out. Then you have the vote. Because conference committee ironed them out, they still have to vote again, so they voted a couple times on it. Um, are you mad that they don't read the bill? Um, what? I, given the length, of certain uh, certain bills, I understand why they can't read all of them. Marcelo, you did all the work. You did this work here. I like you. I'm a Democrat. I'm with you. Why wouldn't? I? Why do I have to read it? I trust him, right? He says, "Vote for the bill. It's a good bill. We did the best we could. We got everything that we wanted." He'll tell me about the bill, and then I said, "Okay, sure." He did a lot of work. It's four thousand pages long, right? You're a Republican. Do you have to read it to vote no? You know him. I think you should know about the bill at least. Of course, the committee does. They do. The they know all about it. They're the ones that you put on that committee that knows, and they know everything about it. If there are Republicans and they don't like Marcelo's bill, what are they going to say? Don't vote for it because it's not a good bill. Do you have to read it? I think they should still. I at least know. have some kind of overview of it. Do you think they'd get anything done? No, but do <laughs> No, I'm just, if they read every bill, there's how many bills? 10,000 of them every year? 
That's a lot of reading. That's what the staff is for. No, she doesn't like that either. She wants you to read it. Well, I mean, they don't have to read it exactly, but they need to know what it's about, at least what's... Marcella was nice. What'd you put there? An executive summary on there, right? He put there major parts of the bill. Gave me a one or two pager of what I need to know. So what about 429 has that death penalty in there, right? Nobody knew that. So, but that's how we do it. Um, will you get your way? I don't know. But a lot of people do like the idea they want people to read it. And they have stuff on there to do that. And then, of course, what can the president do? Mm -hmm. Veto. What else? Pocket veto. And what's that? Whenever uh, Congress is in session and he doesn't uh, do anything with the bill for 10 days. So he doesn't have to take responsibility for vetoing the bill. It just automatically gets vetoed. Okay. And what, is a, what if he doesn't sign it and Congress is in session? It's yeah, automatically vetoed. Yeah. Long. Yep. And then can he strike out parts of the bill? No. Nope. Not anymore. Unconstitutional. Yep. Item line veto is not allowed. And how no. much, if he vetoes it, what does Congress have their choice to do? Override it. Two thirds. Two thirds. Of both houses. Yep. Of both houses. Kind of hard to do. So party constituency ideology. So in Congress, the party influence, party leaders may not force party members to vote a particular way. But many do vote along party lines, and they do. If you don't bite my way, Marcelo, you lose that committee. You, you might, I might take him off the committee. I might remove him from a committee chairmanship. So the speaker has a lot of power. The leaders have a lot of power to do that. Most constituents are uninformed about their member. It's difficult for constituents to influence in their member. I definitely no. I mean, the Republicans are mad at their party. People are angry at their part. It makes sense. Okay. Look at lobbyists and interest groups. Thousands of lobbyists try to influence Congress. Bigger the issue, the more lobbyists. Lobbyists can be ignored, shunned, and even regulated by Congress, but they're not. Um, lobbyists and others influence Congress. The people really don't. I would love for the people to call the Congress people, but do they? No. But who does? A lobbyist, the NRA, or other, you know, the teachers' um, unions and stuff like that. Okay. Pork barrel, earmarking, um, look at these. Isn't this amazing? Look at this. Isn't that great? John McCain was, hated that. It's terrible. What do you think about that? What? It's a federal project. Gives you jobs, gives you money, improves the area. It's not going to yield anything. Jobs. To those 50 people? Maybe it's important. Why? They used to fly. Now you don't have to. What's the problem with it? I mean, a lot of our projects, you don't see the benefits until years later. Yeah, what if there's development on that island? Well, you don't know. 2005, 15000 costing $47 billion. But that helps local communities, local areas, doing some of those things. So now the House of Representatives passed a rule requiring Congress members to attach their names to earmarks <laughs> to certify they have no financial interest in them. Because John McCain is really against them. No earmarks. No pork barrel. That's kind of hard to do. And you want that stuff in your area, don't you? Heck, I'd like the federal government to give money for the Route 60 or Route 10. Light ramp. Because the state's not going to do it. The state's not going to give the money, so why not get some of that money? Thoughts on these? Yes? But then why doesn't John McCain like pork barrels then? Because look how much it is. Look oh, how much it costs. Because 5% of the, the amount of money we spend. Maybe like less than 5%. Oh, I know. It's a, it's a political issue, but he's like, it's where we spend too much money. It adds to bills. You put a you put the bridge to nowhere, which is not that much money, on a defense bill, and it goes through. So you put it on these. It's a rider in, in a lot of cases. So you put these projects on riders that will pass for something else, and then that happens. No, NASA budget. She wants something done. She goes to Marcelo and says, "Will you do this?" And he'll say, "What?" 
No. No, you'll say yes if. <laughs> oh, if you um. Put a rider on. Yeah, do something for me. Correct. Log What's that called? Log rolling. Log That's log rolling. So she wants her bridge to know where. For your bridge to know where. You both say sure. I'll vote for your bridges. That's log rolling. Oh my goodness, president, we're now on president. Okay, we'll hit the bureaucracy and do that. Questions? Make sense? Mm -hmm. Do you agree or disagree with any of them? Protestant is still there, even though Bernie's Jewish. Who is the most religious in this election? Hillary. Hillary is the most religious, the one that goes to church, the one that really does absolutely oh, yeah. believe in religion. Oh. Yeah, not Ted. It's between Bernie, and Trump, and Hillary. But yeah, Ted, before that, absolutely. Okay. I was going to say, I was like, what are you talking about? No, but the ones now, sorry. Um, and then Mike Huckabee, go figure, he was a preacher. So, um, All men are professions, mostly ones are governors. For example, we've had a few senators recently. Um, we thought possibly with Ted or Marco, we'd keep that going. Uh, what are you missing right there? Businessmen, right? Do we have many businessmen up there? Yeah. Who? Who's been a good businessman that was oh, president? In the political, in the presidential election? Yeah, besides oh, that, we have Trump. And a lot of people have told me they want to see, will a businessman be good? Could we don't have him. When was the last good businessman that was a president? That's a good question. Correct. I would say never. You could say George W. Bush. Was he a businessman or was he a politician? Really I don't know. He was the governor of Texas, but he also ran the Texas Rangers, was into baseball, was into oil. So he had business interests, so that's true. Um, Jimmy Carter, not even going to say he was good or bad, but he was a peanut farmer and a governor. Which is he known for more? Governor. So we look at that. Um, I think Calvin Coolidge was the last real business person that we had that would ran that for doing just about nothing. Absolutely. So we'll see with Trump. We'll see how it goes. Okay? Wilma Road to the White House. Elections, of course. Once elected, you get two terms or a term of four years. We're now term limited. Do you guys like that? Depends. I'm kind of sad. Yeah. Could have had Ronald Reagan had a third term, even though he had Alzheimer's. He would have been elected. Bill Clinton would have been reelected. Yeah. I think Obama might. Yeah, yeah. yeah. at this point, okay. yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Most presidents been elected to office. Who was not elected to office? Uh, Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, absolutely. Was not elected to either president or vice president. What? what I guess you um, after. Um. That was with Nixon. So Gerald Ford was um, picked as vice president after Spiro Agnew dropped out because he was convicted of bribery and other things. So Gerald Ford was appointed and then um, confirmed by the House and the Senate. And then Nixon resigned and then Gerald Ford became president. So he actually had both offices without being elected. And then at one time we had both president and vice president never elected. Um, so we've got secession, impeachment. We know who's been impeached. Okay. And then the 25th Amendment, remember what happens if the president's disabled or what happens there. The line of secession was 1947, 47 Presidential Secession Act. What would a Clinton be, have been convicted for if he had been impeached? Like a, Lying under oath. Uh, so the Monica Lewis thing wasn't an actual crime? No. Oh. It was the lying to Congress. Yeah, it's not illegal to have sex with no, someone. No, well, what, did, what, did, what was the loss of Monica Lewinsky? Be? Like, what, how was it brought up? What do you mean? As in, didn't Monica Lewinsky sue? It's no, I, I think it started as a scandal because somebody yeah, was they just found out about it. And they he denied it, and yeah. then that's when the proceedings began. So, but even why? Well, that's what I'm asking. Is like, why would he deny it under oath? Like, what what led the, what situation led to that? To him being under oath. That's Most of his lying was about other affairs. Paul Jones and uh. stuff that he was actually because he had affairs previous to joining, and then he had. Lawsuits and things, and Paula Jones sued him. So that was the main issue. All right, constitutional powers of the president. I don't know if I skipped constitutional powers of Congress, um, and I might have, but I don't know because there's 18 in Congress. Make sure you know those. 
but not many here, right? President and Commander in Chief makes treaties, nominate ambassadors, receive ambassadors. You know, State of the Union, that's the one that doesn't even have to do it in person, but we do it. Recommends legislation, doesn't have to. I don't think Obama did that. George W. Bush did a lot of that. Um, convene both houses on extraordinary circumstances. Adjourn Congress if they can't agree. You know, this is take care of, laws are faith faithfully executed. So not a lot of huge powers, right? But we see that the president is probably more powerful than Congress and the Supreme Court. Okay. So here is the picture. This is the executive office of the president. You also have the White House office, which is the West Wing type thing. So look at the White House is off to the side. The White House, these guys, I can pick whoever I want if I'm president. I can pick my friends. They're normally people on the campaign. They're your buddies. You can be there, the people that you trust. All of these heads have to be nominated and confirmed. Confirmed by the Senate. Okay. So executive office, all of those, look at those people. You might find some that are, um, you'll have a cabinet. you have cabinet positions under the president. So we've got National Security Council. That will have your, ge your generals, that will have your people in the military, your secretary of defense. President roles, we, there's lots of roles, but he's chief legislator, he can veto, pocket veto. I don't mind viewing that word again. Governors have it, but not the president. When is the honeymoon period for the president? 120 days. Right after their win, and who knows how long it is today. So some people might say it might be the first six months. Some people say it's sh it's shorter in the second term than the first term. Okay. Party leadership. So the president is the leader of the party. Um, do you think President Obama will go on the election campaign? I, I don't think so. Why? You don't think so? I feel like if he, he was going to, he would have already done it. Do you think Hillary or Bernie would want it? I think Hillary would. Hillary would want it much more than Bernie. Why? I mean, I agree with that. I totally agree with that. But do you really think Bernie would say, nah, I don't want you? Well, no, no. I just feel like Bernie would be, is less, uh, it's not as integral to his campaign to say that President Barack Obama supports me as it would be uh, for Hillary Clinton to do the same. Okay. I, I mean, right now, did uh, George W. Bush campaign with John McCain? No, no, not at all, because he was very unpopular. You've got right now, Obama's at 50, 51, 52%. You go to a Democratic state, he'll be fine with Bernie or Hillary. Um, one of the problems, they said Al Gore didn't win. He didn't use Bill Clinton, a very popular president, didn't use him to campaign. So um, you use, I mean, he's the leader of the party. Chief diplomat, advising consent with treaties, executive agreements. Uh, what was Obama's big things that he's done as a diplomat? Iran. Iran. Iran deal, what else? Syria. Yes, he did Syria. That's a thing. I don't know. He's trying to do that. What else? Mm. Kind of big. Russia. In this hemisphere. Haiti. No. Close. Oh, we forget Cuba. Cuba. Oh, yeah, of course. Cuba. Of course. Of course. Land of no Adidas. <laughs> yeah. Commander in chief. This is what Obama's done quite, like you said, with Syria, the drones, de decisions, leaving Iraq, building up Afghanistan. Absolutely. Unthinkable 200 years ago. They didn't want to stand in the army. War powers resolution, like I said, no, that war powers act. Um, whether it's constitutional or not, it's never gone to the Supreme Court. Uh, most presidents just ignore it. Obama wants to influence it, wants to use it. Why? He wants Congress behind him. He wants Congress to take a stand, and Congress has said no. There was somebody that wanted to sue President Obama for his military actions because he's unauthorized to do it. He tried to get Congress to pass. He's asked them to pass it. They haven't done it. 
crisis manager. So if something happens, he, whether it's a natural disaster. natural disaster, it could be the economy, could be something with technology. I remember, you don't remember this, but there's a big problem in 1999. Y2K. Yes, does anybody know about that? Yes, supposedly all computers are going to shut down because they could not compute like the year 2000. It would be the year 1900. Mm -hmm. It would be awful. It would be terrible. Computers would shut down. Absolutely. It was nothing out of nothing. But that was a big, big problem, and the presidents were behind all this thing, trying to get everything done. Didn't do, there was only a few little glitches in a few little states in there. And then, of course, work with Congress, has the lead role in foreign affairs, still have to work for support funding things. This is where, and you don't see it because Obama hasn't done it, George W. did it more, but going into the public, having, you know, you know, fireside chats. Most of you don't know, Obama talks every Saturday. Ooh. Not know that. Yeah. yeah, every Saturday gives his radio address. <laughs> so it's there. We're not a little late. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but it's like nobody knows. But he, why should he? He should be doing it in light. He should be doing it, you know, once a month or something, talking to people. Uh, public approval gives him his leverage, but not command. Public appearances are staged to get our attention. Of course they are. And he performs many ceremonial functions, usually favorable press coverage. Uh, mandates. So that's where the president says, you elected me, I've got a mandate to do this. Um, they claim a mandate. George W. Bush claimed one. Obama did after, you know, 2012. And you've seen this or some form of it. Isn't that great? George. What about George? That's a precipitous decline. Yeah. There was one point, and this didn't say it, but I saw that he, after, like, 9-11, had the 80% Look at Clinton. Yeah, he's the one that, like, really Yeah, him. impeach him, and he goes up. <laughs> Attack him, he goes up. I told you. The more negative stuff, look what happens. Drove Republicans crazy. Okay? And then George H.W., his problem was he would never been to the grocery store. And they asked him about what, what grocery would cost, and he couldn't tell you. And he, they, they asked him when was the last time he was in the grocery store. He couldn't tell you. Uh, Mitt Romney. So, what? Mitt Romney walked in the grocery store and didn't pick up a cart. Yeah. Well, Bush never. Look at Reagan, kind of low down up Before there. Or Johnson. Yeah, Johnson. That was Vietnam War. Everybody know the differences? Expenditures, revenues. How much do we spend and uh, make in an average year now? I think revenue is something like one and a half trillion. Spend like two, almost two. You're only off by a one and a half trillion. We spend about and raise about three trillion dollars. So say we raise three trillion, our deficit, so we spend about three point five trillion. So we're about five hundred billion, four hundred billion now in a in a deficit. Everybody know the difference between deficit and debt? Okay. And then budgets. Okay. Where's our money come from? Personal income taxes, personal income taxes is number one. Now, what they're looking at, see that big purple, the social insurance taxes? That's huge, and that's growing. Now, it's 15% of your income, up to like $106,000. So, you pay 7.5%, your company pays 7.5%, that's a huge amount. Um, that's more because you can't opt out of that. Marcelo, you got a job? No. Anybody here got a job? Nobody have a job? Mike, you got a job? Just, it's not so that I would uh, okay. pay taxes. If you have a job, you can't tax. opt out of that. You can yeah. opt out of, you can go exempt on personal income taxes, but you can't opt out of the FICA taxes. So that's why it's a lot bigger. Um, it used to be corporate income taxes were more than personal income taxes. Used to be we could get more from corporations. Now it's not even close. And so now we write off uh, restaurants and expenditures. Of course. Of course. Look at our national debt. Cut taxes, it does have an effect. So if you, like Reagan cut taxes, George W. Bush cut taxes, um, it makes a difference. But this is not to say it's bad or good, just cutting taxes does spur the economy, but it does increase the debt. Tax loopholes, um, tax expenditures, tax reduction, tax reform, haven't had too much tax reform, but what would be your way to deal with taxes? What's your favorite thing? What would Raise you do? them. 
What? Raise them. You'd raise them on who? Everybody? On the rich. On the rich. What would you do? I'll probably do the same thing. You liberal chief. What would you do? Oh, I'd raise them on everybody. You'd raise them on everybody. You Bernie, you. Yes. I don't know. I know my mom wanted something like a progressive flat rate. You want a, that's inter a progressive flat rate. Some Republicans you have said progressive flat rate. something that wasn't We're super complicated because she said that um, progressive a normal progressive would be too complicated for accountants to do. Which, so like, so the rate is still the same sure. per dollar rather than so, having it so that it's exponential. So Mike, uh -huh. right now there might be nine tax rates. So I have three. That's a progressive flat tax. So that is 28, 15, 36, something like that, instead of having all these different ranges. Or maybe go to two. Still have progressive, 10 and 20. That's still flatter, and it's progressive. So that's the idea. But I agree, it's kind of like an oxymoron. You don't want, they're different. But, and then, of course, a lot of Republicans will want the flat tax, right? Mm -hmm. Just to have it go straight 15% all the way through. Um, would you, any of you get rid of loopholes? Absolutely. God, like what? Yeah. Like the money. Yeah. I, think I have a mortgage. That's a loophole. I don't have to pay taxes on it. I reduce my taxes on my mortgage. I am married. Oh. I get a tax break based on me being married. I think that to me is a benefit. It's a benefit tax break for a few people. I don't know. No, I few, some. Few people married. But so what? What do you think? Uh, it might, you, might not be a loophole, you're right, I'm not big, but it still is a tax, huge thing that we have. Goes against you guys, because you're single. You can make the same amount of money as I do, and I get less taxes than you do. Anything else? Anything that you would change? I think just tax avoidance is a, yeah. something I'm more concerned about. You're concerned about it? I, You can justify, for example, giving a tax break to a someone who has a family, mm -hmm. for the value that that family provides to the nation. But there's no value in a, a company or an individual, but especially a company given the, uh, the greater volume of, or the greater amount of money that's being involved. When they avoid taxes, it doesn't help anybody. Sure. So for you, the um, Panama Papers are important. Yeah. To we most Americans, that. they could care less. And we'll see. Maybe we'll have Americans that are there. So look at this. Everybody thought defense is the biggest? And it is. It's huge. It's the biggest for discretionary. Yes, absolutely. It's the biggest for discretionary. The, and the payments for individuals, that can include welfare, that can include Social Security, that can include any type of aid for disabilities, any of those things. So that's a huge number, but it's not maybe, it might be five programs. Defense is the biggest that is um, discretionary, like you said, and we do like more than nine different countries. But look at interest. What I could do with a couple hundred billion dollars, right? That's a huge number. The other non-defense, transportation, all the other stuff is in there. Look at our defense spending. Don't question that whatsoever. And that's one reason why I get, we don't ever question the, the military. It went down. What? For those five, six, seven years after this was made, it went down. They were blaming Clinton, but here is like the you know the Clinton years going down a little bit, and then it just gets shot up. Okay. Don't have Obamas, but it's probably gone. It's flattened. Okay. Uncontrollable ones. Those would be your entitlements to Social Security. The only way to control them is to change the rules, change the 70 years instead of 59 and a half, uh, change any of the things when you get it or if you have a job, those kind of things. Look at that. Now, will that change? Of course. Baby boomers will die off, right? So it's, it's, you have those, so you have different stuff, but look how big it's going. Make sure you know the differences between the cabinet and the regulatory agencies. Thirteen cabinet members headed by a secretary or like the attorney general. They have their own budget staff. They have their own website. They tell you what they are and what they do. Um, and then regulatory agencies and you have executive agencies. So regulatory agencies, those would be like your Fed, Federal Reserve System. It might be uh, the FAA. Federal Aviation Agency. Um, why are those so evil? 
my age, they, we call them evil. Why do you think they're evil? The FAA. Any of them. FAA. How about FCC? Federal, Com Federal Communications Commission. Howard Stern said that it's evil. Because they regulate. Yes. Why? I, I, I've heard arguments because they're regulating on like an arbitrary moral basis for certain ah. things. Okay. So Congress makes a law you can't have obscene on the radio, yeah. right? What's obscene? Who makes the decision? The FCC. Who actually does the research on an obscene, obscene claim on Howard Stern? The FCC. So you're a caller. You say Howard Stern swear that I hated this. So you make a complaint to the FCC. They research the complaint. They get the complaint. They did all that. What else did they do? They find him. They did. So they were the judge, the jury. They were everybody. So they actually made the rule, what's obscene. They actually enforced the rule. And they made the punishment. So they were all three branches of government in that little agency. So a lot of people say they have too much power. Because they can do all of those things. F, uh, EPA, same thing. They'll take a rule, then they make the things with it, and then they'll enforce it, and then they'll fine. And they do those. So um, I think they need to be to have that. But um, they're kind of like one of those, a lot of people say they have too much power. So just remember the iron triangles. Interest group, so tobacco. Uh, congressional subcommittee might be on business or agriculture in there. And then your bureaucracy, the tobacco division of the Department of Agriculture. So you have everybody's related with tobacco. Rulings on tobacco products and prices go this way. Information about the industry goes that way. Support for the budget goes that way. Campaign contributions go this way. Information about the industry goes this way. Legislation goes that way. And then information goes here, help with constituents' complaints go here, and then budgets go this way. <clears throat> so we have those, that's the iron triangle. And what we also forget about these is these people move from place to place to place, right? The revolving door is somebody that works in an interest group, the tobacco lobby all of a sudden runs for Congress, or gets in the bureaucracy, or they move around in different positions. Okay. So there's your government corporations, and then there's your independent executive agencies. NASA, do, do they exist anymore? NASA? Yeah. yeah. They're still, still there? By, still by far the largest. They're larger than all the other uh, space programs of every other country in the world combined. They're just, we've just wiped them out. From our perspective. Yeah. yeah. Okay. President and uh, tries to control the bureaucracy. Congress tries to control the bureaucracy. So look at those, make sure you know that. But the bureaucracy has their own life of their own. Like you said, that was part of the bureaucratic view. All right. Do we get to, I guess we'll do the Supreme Court here. All right. Two types of cases, criminal and civil law. Uh, criminal, we don't spend um, a lot of time with our cases. Most of them are the civil ones, but there will be some due process, the court ones. Um, a lot of them are First Amendment rights, Second Amendment rights, and those kind of things. So we've got criminal law, charges against a, uh, an individual, violated law, and then disputes. Does so everybody know the defendants, the, the plaintiff, standing, what standing means? Okay. No reason. Yeah. Okay. So, say Ted Cruz got the nomination, and you wanted to sue him. You'd have to have standing. So who would sue? Donald Trump. Trump. Why? Because he says he's not a citizen. So what? So you? Natural citizen. And you can make the argument that it's going to actually harm him. That's the. Yeah, it has. It has stand. to have a serious interest in the case. So you and I can't sue, even though I think that's wrong. We do have a serious interest, but they've said we can't sue. Donald Trump would, or one of the losers that lost to Ted Cruz. It could be Marco Rubio. But they still have to prove do they have standing. So you have to have some case. The most famous one was the, uh, the California proposition that was marriages between a man and a woman. So that was the proposition. That was Proposition 8. 
Well, the California decided not to defend Proposition 8. They said, we agree that it shouldn't be there. We don't like it. This group took up defending Proposition 8. Did they have any standing? They weren't part of California. They weren't even from California. They didn't have any money involved in it. They were a religious group that helped be on the one side. And the Supreme Court made a decision. They have no standing. So it's very important that the plaintiff have some kind of interest in the case. Um, case must be a, a matter of law. Most of the time, the judiciary doesn't want to get into political issues. Okay. Remember the rule of four, the writ of Setiari. Very few cases are accepted. How many do you think are accepted? What's the number? Hundred, right? About a hundred, maybe eighty to hundred. Very few. So you have federal courts and state courts go into the request. Okay. Appeals discussed in conference. Appeals denied. Get four votes. Puts on the dock. And that's how it goes there. Oh. Okay. Here are your different opinions. Remember, you, you got the stare deceases, precedence. That's normally what we do. We look at the original intent. Is the idea that you should look at the intent of the framers or judicial activism. Judges should make bolder decisions. Look at what's happening today. Dissenting opinions, those who lost. Concurring are they agree but have a different reason. Here's implementing a court decision, interpreting population, understand the decision, implementing it, people actually need to carry it out, and the consumer population, people who are affected or could be affected by the decision. So, in the last one with gay marriage, do we know who are the, who is the consumer population? Businesses. You can say businesses. Uh, businesses. Probably everybody, Small. right? Yeah. But it's businesses and possibly gays, lesbians. Implementing, who would do that? Businesses. Businesses, bureaucracy. Uh, bureaucracy had to change. Church, the grant for the marriage licenses. Okay. Does the federal government get involved? Did the Justice Department get involved? They did. They have. Yeah. Yeah. They have. Okay. Okay. Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights, First Ten Amendments, written to restrict the national government, mostly Congress. S most are incorporated in state and local laws now. Do you agree with that? What? The, the local Selective rights. incorporation. Um, screw that. Do you agree with it, Marissa? Um, I'm not sure. What well, if think? it's I such agree. a fundamental right to freedom of religion, and the federal government can't make a religion, why can North Carolina? Oh. You know what I mean? So this would say North Carolina can't make a state religion. Just like Congress can't make a state religion, any local area can't make a state religion. What do you think, Alexa? That sounds about right. I don't think religion should be involved in politics. Okay. Civil liberties, remember this is your protection against the government. Civil rights is your protections against people. Okay. So then we have these are our amendments. So this is the First Amendment. So this covers petition, assemble, freedom of speech, freedom of press, religion. This is right to bear arms. I like the, I always would like to bring out the wonderful sentence that goes right after this. Comma, those people that are based on religious beliefs don't have to serve, don't have to serve. Because that kind of shows you it was a military one, not a right to own a gun. This is a military one, quartering soldiers. So these are like your military ones. Look at all of your search and seizures, the right of the people to be secure in their homes, houses, papers, effects against search and seizures. Shall not be violated, no warrant shall, not, shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or confirmation. So that's huge. Fifth Amendment has got a lot. It's got imminent domain, due process, self-incrimination, double jeopardy, grand jury. It's got five things in it. And then you've got six. This is your speedy and public trial, impartial jury. Must be where the law, where the crime was committed. You must be informed of the nature, cause of the accusation. Confront your witnesses. Have a way to get witnesses in your favor. Have the assistance of counsel. That's all in six. 
Does that say Miranda rights? No. No? But that's what it says for six. Does that say that you have to have a free attorney? No. Nope. nope. Doesn't. It says you must have an attorney. Have to get an attorney. Have to have the assistance of counsel. Where does it say once provided for you free of expense? Doesn't say that. That's Gideon versus Wainwright that says that. Then here he is, wonderful common law. What's the dollar amount? Twenty dollars. Has it changed? Nope. <laughs> so it's still twenty bucks. Excessive bail shall not be required. Excessive fines nor cruel or unusual punishment. And then look at number nine. The enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. Wait a minute. Actually, for uh, the Sixth Amendment. Isn't that kind of implied for Miranda rights? Because my understanding was that with Miranda rights, the whole thing is that you can't use um, evidence that's gathered um, without the consent. So you can't use evidence that's gathered from an individual before their rights are read. Well, it's implied. It's implied right. by the witness. Right. This all, it all comes from there. There's nothing wrong with this. They just made up. They just added more to it. And what I was just saying, the. You must have assistance of counsel. It doesn't say free. It doesn't say paid for. You might say it's applied, but it took a Supreme Court case to do it. So right to privacy, right to abortion is in number nine, right? She's going like, no way, no way. Doesn't exist there, right? And then number ten is her favorite one. You hate it. I hate it. No, you hate number ten. Of course you do. You're a liberal. This is the conservatives' ones. Power not delegated oh, yeah. to the United States Constitution or privileged states are reserved to the states or the people. The reserve powers come there. Okay. 14th Amendment, Equal Protection Clause. So this is good to actually see. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the U.S. or any state deprive any person of life, liberty, property without due process. Nor shall any state deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the law. That's where gay marriage came in. Even though they said that wasn't the intent, that's where gay marriage, equal protection under the law, due process. Okay. So we use selective incorporation on a case-by-case -case basis to take the Bill of Rights and bring it to the states. Okay. So you've got freedom of religion, establishment clause, free exercise clause. We've gone through that pretty good, right? Some religious practices may conflict with other rights, then be denied or punished. Prior restraint. This is near versus Minnesota. This is where the government prevents material from being published. That's censorship. That's not allowed. That was a 1931 case. You may have censorship in wartime. Not afterwards. And may be punished after something is published. Free speech, public order, limit... Free speech, if it's clear and present danger, that's Schneck versus the U.S. So that's the clear and present danger part there that you can limit speech there. Permissible to advocate the violent overthrow of government in abstract, but not to incite anyone to do that. Okay? Limited if on private property, like a shopping center. Free press, fair trials, public has a right to know what happens. Press's own information may not be protected. There are shield laws. And then, the C I love Miller versus California. You remember that? What did the justice say? Test. I know, that's the test. What did he say about obscenity? I don't know what it is, but when yeah, I see it, I'll yeah. tell you what it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can't really define it, but when I see it, I'll let you know that's obscene. And then this is like the, makes, it's, makes it obscene. So it lacks serious artistic, political, scientific value. It's painfully offensive. It appeals to that animal nature in people. Is, is satire protected under that? It would be. Okay. Libel and slander. Know the differences between the two. One's written, one's verbal. Slander is? Uh, spoken. Yes. So in notice that you have to, it's difficult to prove because what? You have to prove malice. You have to intrude, prove that they intended it. And it also has to be false. You can't, if it's true, you can't do that. Ted Cruz's four wives or whatever. Yeah. Symbolic speech, burning the flag or wearing an armband. Now that's symbolic speech. It wasn't in the original there. 
Uh, commercial speech is the most restricted and regulated form. Um, and we're giving more and more commercial free you know, speech. Um, right of assembly, it's permissible, but we can basically say you can meet over here, you can protest in a certain area, um, we can say be 50 yards away from this area, this spot when you want to protest. You can't be protesting in a Planned Parenthood right in the front of the door. You have to be a certain area, a certain spot for me. Right to associate, you have the freedom of join groups, associations, without government interference. Here's your search and seizure. What's the exclusionary rule? That's MAP versus Ohio. What's that? Um, As you can read it. Yeah. You can't use evidence that's uh, obtained, how? obtained legally. Illegally. So you can't use it, no matter how incriminating, you can't use it if it was illegally obtained. Now they've kind of later on said, yeah, you can if you didn't mean to be bad. If you didn't know it or if it was, you know, you can use it. But that was the map versus Ohio, you can't use this. Uh, Self-incrimination, Miranda warnings, that's where you were saying you have to be told that anything you use can be used against you. Entrapments may be overturned. Right to counsel, remember I said Gideon versus Rain White, state must provide lawyers in most criminal cases. That's with the Sixth Amendment. And then plea bargaining, we love plea bargaining because that actually gets less people in the jury, you know, less cases, less things like that. And then, is, do we have the death penalty in all states? No. no, some states don't have it. Some have stopped it, and then others do it quite a bit. Okay. Is there a right to privacy? It's a good question. The Ninth Amendment's where you would be. It's not explicitly stated. They say it's implied by the Fourth Amendment with your right to privacy, with due process, with that, you know, warrants and stuff like that. I use the Ninth Amendment. Griswold versus Connecticut. That was the birth control case with married adults. And then Roe versus Wade, and then Planned Parenthood. So there's a few things with abortion, and that's still right to privacy. So most people believe it should be legal abortion, but it's only under circumstances. See, look, 26 under any circumstances. And then 18 illegal in all cases. This is civil rights. Equal protection. So you're protect, protecting people against discrimination by government officials or individuals, normally states. So you have Dred Scott. What was that voted? The worst decision ever? Yeah. Didn't, you, didn't you see that? Worst decision ever? Uh, then you have the end of slavery. Then you have Jim Crow laws. Plessy versus Ferguson. It's right up there. Right? One-eighth black, and you can't uh, still, you're separate. And then Brown versus Board of Education overturned Plessy. And then the Civil Rights Act made racial discrimination in many areas. The difference between the Civil Rights Act of 67 and 64? 67's for voting specifically, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Civil Rights Act was 64 and 68, and 68 was in housing. 64 was normally in public accommodations like that, but then housing was in 68, and then the other one was for voting. Okay. Ooh, Korematsu, you know. Native American, Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martinez. Other minority groups have been, they go in the courts, and I think there's been some where uh, marijuana with Native Americans was not allowed. So they couldn't use that as part of their tradition, so that would stop for their, and they were saying it's their freedom of religion. Okay. Women, 19th Amendment, their right to vote, 1920, um, did not get the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, women in the workplace, there is still wage discrimination, there's that comparable worth. Can anyone tell me what comparable worth means? No. It's more from econ, but it was the idea that if you both have similar requirements or jobs, you should be paid the same amount, even if you're in different fields. So a nurse versus a truck driver, UPS truck driver, the UPS truck driver makes more than the nurse. So they compare those two because of the male in that makes more than the female in that. You should bring up the nurses to make as much as the UPS truck driver. That's comparable. And that's that idea. Most people don't like that. 
They don't like bringing them up because a judge does that. Women in the military, they're allowed. They're working on front lines. They're getting in Army Rangers, and there's a huge amount of sexual harassment. And no sexual harassment rules, laws. Do you all know? Think we covered them good? Yeah. What do you think, David? I don't know. I was just saying, like, uh, what was the, the thing that says that you can make laws um, if it's reasonable? That's women. Reasonable discrimination is called the reasonable standard. And strict scrutiny is laws with race and African Americans are looked under strict scrutiny. Okay. So we've got gays and lesbian rights, Bowers versus Harwig, Lawrence versus Texas, and then we have Oberfell, which is the one allowing gay marriage. That will not be on the test, but that's the newest one, probably in five years it will be. Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, very big, you'll see that possibly. Affirmative action, you've got the Vaki case, that's the biggest one that you'll see, and that's reverse discrimination. And then all these others, look at Gratz versus Bollinger, struck down point system, but upheld law school affirmative action. So we've got a mixed result on affirmative action. Okay. Public policy, this is unit six, this is the last part. So this is the one that we just covered. So you look at economic policy, so you look at uh, Securities Exchange Commission, minimum wage, labor unions, collective bargaining, unemployment, inflation, CPI, GDP. So all of the economic policy, fiscal policy, there was one, uh, I showed you the essay on fiscal and monetary policy, that was in a government one. So just kind of like review that a little bit. Federal Reserve Board, so when you get it, this will be all on, this could be on the AP government test. But the Federal Reserve and monetary policy, antitrust policy, fiscal policy. Now, this is a little bit different. We, this is where we've got entitlement programs, know what they are. Means tested. Government only provides people that fall below a certain level. So that means, and some people want a means test for Social Security. What do you guys think? If it's the purpose of yes, it's, 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 it's not. It's an entitlement, so there's no correct. Concern. But you know why they do it? What they're saying is Donald Trump should not get Social Security. But he paid into it. That is correct. That's why it's an entitlement. But there are people that say if you're a billionaire, shouldn't get. It. So I agree. So what about food stamps? Should we have a means test? Uh, How about you lost your job? I mean, there is a means test with the poverty line. You know, your, your income level. Okay. The, uh, the Look what poor is. 14,000. For a family of three. Yeah, but they, they, my understanding is they usually go like a certain percentage above, so like 300% above the poverty line will qualify you for a certain benefit. Sure. Mm -hmm. How much do teachers make on average? How much what? The teachers make on average. Oh, I, I think it's a, about 50,000. Uh, I'm still not there yet, but I think that's about the average. Uh, many people move in and out of poverty in a lifetime, in a year's time. I would say in your lifetime, you might be in poverty one year, right? Your college years, maybe right after, you never know. Okay. Right? What cons considers a family must spend for? So 36.5 million, about 12% were poor in 2006. All right. Everybody know the differences between the three taxes? Progressive, regressive, proportional. Earned income tax, that. Then there was somebody I heard that said in Europe they're trying to go to a negative income tax. Mm -hmm. yeah, there sense. are a couple of countries that they want to have a basic income. So sure. Sweden, Sweden, Sweden does that. Yes, yeah, yeah. Sweden. Sweden. So no transfer payments. Some benefits are actually money, some are not. Some get food stamps because we don't like giving poor money, so we give them stamps so they can, we can control what they buy. Welfare as we knew it, okay. it's not basically, this has changed, this was big, ending welfare, so it's not lifetime, you have a certain amount of time that's on it, the state gets the rules, people on welfare have to find work within two years, so a lot of you think we're still up there in 1935, not even close, people should possibly get it, but they're not getting it because they missed the time. Lifetime of five years placed on welfare, two in one year, and then if things happen. 
Then we have the names change. Temporary assistance for needy families. New Deal, Social Security grown. Everybody knows about Social Security. Three different parts to it. Disability, death, and then old age. So we have those. Um, some people say that we need to raise the retirement age. Some people say we need to cut benefits. Some would say raise taxes or raise the percent. Others would say, say let Donald Trump pay taxes on his whole income, not just on 106000 but pay it on everything. Republicans favor privatizing it, getting rid of it. Health care. We spend the most on health care of any country. This is one I was absent. I had those questions for you. This $43 million have no health insurance. That's dropped with Obamacare, but it's still about $20 million. Most of the time you have a health insurance when you have a job. You lose a job, you lose it. That's the nice thing to get it on the exchange. Health insurance closely tied to race and income. And then remember the difference, and you were kind of like doing it. This is poor. This is elderly. This is run by the states and block grants. This is run by the federal government. So make sure you, it's common to flip them and miss those up. Okay. We still spend the most on health care of any country that we have. And we, uh, are we good at it? What do you think? And there are a lot of uh, treatments that are very effective in the U.S. cancer treatment. Sure. In particular. So here's environment, EPA, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, all done under Nixon. When I say he was the last liberal president, that's why. EPA, clean air, clean water. He did tons of stuff. And it did work. It really did. Lake Erie did burn. The Tumac River was polluted. I mean, it was really, really, it was, it was dead. I mean, nothing was living there. Carp couldn't even. Now they're, they're alive again. So this stuff does work. But are we going to do cap and trade? What do we do? I, I thought this was great. Let's take all of our nuclear waste and put them in Nevada. Does that make sense? Yeah, the mountain. That's a good idea, actually. It, I'm not saying it's bad, but it was the idea is let's take all of the nuclear waste throughout the country on train or truck and then bring it deep under the mountain. There's so many bad things that can so we do nothing. So well, it's I mean, where it is. for nuclear missiles the mm -hmm. same way. Sure. No, I know. It's just there's people that... Then we've got toxic waste. What has your waste sites? Remember what I was telling you about the rain, the acid rain, and the brown rain that happened? Um, we do own a lot of national preserves, national parks. A lot of people don't think the federal government should, but we have that. I was looking at endangered species. We protect... A lot. Just put it that way. We do. Not tuna, though. Tuna's going to be extinct. Sure. Only the bluefin tuna. Yeah, bluefin. The big ones. That it was interesting. Um, I had somebody from West Virginia on. It was on the, on the, I think it was on NPR, talking about Hillary Clinton's comment that cola should die, but they didn't read the whole thing that she was saying. We should give $30 billion to people in coal country to change their jobs, to change them to... New jobs. But look at that. Coal is the most abundant. It's the dirtiest. It's 40, oil is 40% of our energy. We're actually an exporter of oil. It's fascinating. Why do we do it? We import and we export. Ta -da. Ta -da. Did this help? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys think for an overall review? It's pretty good. Okay. What time you got? It is 3.30. Okay. Which is why my alarm's